thank you and I appreciate the opportunity to actually speak with you all today and to give you some insight as to what is happening within the marketplace around healthcare delivery and healthcare reform and um, being able to share with you our approach to it which is rather unique in some ways but rather old school in other ways. Um, as Amal had pointed out to you, um, I have worked on pretty much the insurance side um, of healthcare for probably just about 15 years now. Um, after I finished up school on the West Coast, um, finished up my graduate work at Pepperdine University in Malibu, um, I had actually started to work with um, WellPoint Health Networks, which was the um, primary owner of several blues plans, specifically Blue Cross of California. And since then, I have been um, jet-setting across the country, working for other organizations such as United, as well as Blue Cross Blue Shield of Tennessee. I think what really started to get me into a position of saying, well, I want to be a part of this change, was the debate around healthcare reform and really looking at what we could do differently to provide better care at a higher quality and also being able to control the cost of care. And trying to do that from what I considered the outside from a payer's perspective was rather difficult. So the opportunity to actually come up into the um, Tri-Cities area and to head up Integrated Solutions gave me an opportunity to really start to take a lot of the vision and mold it in such a way that we could actually create a vehicle from which we could develop a, a new way, a different kind of paradigm that would leverage all of the aspects of the healthcare delivery system within a community. And that really is at the, the foundation of a lot of what I'll talk to you about this morning because when you hear a lot of the conversations around accountable care organizations, and by a show of hands, how many of you have even heard of accountable care organizations? So a good number. Well, I'll give you some insight as to accountable care organizations as we go through. But as, as we looked at how do we do this and do it differently, we looked at the community and we looked at unlocking the value of integration. So we could eliminate waste, we could eliminate redundancy, and at the same time align to some objectives that would achieve a certain standard and a certain outcome, a result, specifically for the populations within, within the areas that we serve. So what I'll, what I'll present to you today is kind of what we set up probably about a year ago. And it's been a journey, it'll continue to be a journey, and you'll start to see that theme as we go through this. So what's troubling our healthcare system? When you look at it from the, just, the, just the root cause perspective, you see that we have lower healthcare quality, we have less than desirable outcomes, higher costs, and declining individual health. And I'll talk about the individual aspect because I think it does have a theme here and something that we have to take away as individuals as we participate within the healthcare system. But it's a very important aspect of it and it, it does fall in line with the accountable care. So from a cost and quality, the opportunity that we have as a, as a healthcare delivery system, approximately 700 billion in waste in the US healthcare system Costs associated with poor health care account for 30% of the premiums people pay. Practice variation represents about 30% of unnecessary costs. And 50% of health care spending goes toward bureaucracy, duplicative tests and other waste. 55% chance of receiving care in the U.S. that generally meets accepted standards. And then it takes about 10 to 20 years for a new practice to go from development to widespread adoption. So as we looked at this, we start to say, well, what does the current health care payment system look like? Is payment for activity, not results? Is payment provided on a piecework basis, so that fee-for-service basis? Quality isn't figured into the payment. Um, the worst surgeon, hospital, physician, et cetera, gets the, paid the same as the best. Providers, no incentive to supply quality. And patients, no incentive to demand quality. So why healthcare reform? Well, healthcare taking up too much of our GDP. Um, it's risen dramatically, it's projected to continue to rise, and that's just not sustainable 
when you look at our ability to create economic vitality within our community. Because in essence, what we're doing is we're taking dollars and moving it into taking care of a problem, not really creating something that would um, actually create other economic opportunity. In the current model, hospitals are paid for taking care of sick people in the hospital. There's not a reimbursement around being able to ensure that people are well, that they're healthy. Um, the new model will be helping people to stay well, keeping them healthy and out of the hospital. So healthcare reform, this is where it all started just about a year ago. And having been on the payer side, I can tell you with um, some certainty that a lot of folks were betting that it wasn't going to happen. Um, I was probably in the minority, um, the very small minority. I think I was one out of thousands within our own organization in Tennessee. But I think what I saw in that was that there was a need to change, that we had gotten to a point, it really was the burning platform, and we had to address this now to take accountability, take responsibility for it, because we had the future at stake. So through all the debate, through all the arguments, the pros, the cons, legislation was signed in December of 2009. That was a shock to a lot of folks. Um, they counted it out, they counted it down, but it happened. So what then starts to transform is this legislative process that did not occur, created some issues. Um, the Healthy Human Services, really responsible for deciding numerous details, regulations, and guidelines because some of the, the way in which they got the health care reform bill through um, and get it, got it signed and passed really did cut a lot of corners. So it did leave a lot for the Health and Human Services um, Department Director to really start to define some of the specifics, which is ongoing today. Um, there was concern that health care reform legislation may result in many unanticipated and unintended consequences. That, I would think, will be inherent in any type of bill that's passed, but what we're seeing is that there, there has been an influx of new um, experienced individuals with certain expertise in designing of programs coming from such organizations as Geisinger, Kaiser, from the academic world as well, um, Dr. Don Berwick coming from the Institute for Health Improvement, um, a number of individuals that could demand a very high um, compensation package in the private sector coming in to work in the public sector. Why? Again, they see the need for change. So what I'm seeing as we work with these individuals is that I'm seeing a very well thought out process. They are looking for those things that will be the foundation for an improved health care delivery system in this country. So uh, while we may have some unintended consequences and unanticipated consequences, what we're seeing is some very good, very solid movement forward. There will be likely some additional legislation to fix. Again, what we see in the market today, see a, a lot of debate happening within the judicial system, of whether or not the individual mandate, as an example, is something that is um, unconstitutional or unconstitutional. So there's still ongoing debate that may lead to a fix um, to the um, health care reform bill. And depending on future changes, there's a balance of power um, that we have to look at. And that's also something that as you see what we're putting together here locally within our community through Integrated Solutions and the Mountain States Health Alliance Network is that we're looking at we're looking at the future and we're seeing that there could be a change in who sits in the White House. There could be a change at who represents us in Congress and who represents us in some of these state and or federal agencies. One of the things that we're considering is the ability to create a model that has agility to change, to adapt, that can be more organic in the sense that it's really focused on meeting the needs of the community. So irregardless of what happens at the state level or the federal level, we have the ability to move and to be a change agent here within our communities. We call it strategic agility, and that's really, in essence, the ability to move and move in a direction that continues the process of improvement. Healthcare reform assumptions. This is the underlying assumptions 
into the health care reform bill, pay for value versus volume, population health management versus episodic care. So instead of looking um, at a physician group or a hospital system or the health care delivery system as a whole, instead of looking at it in a fragmented siloed approach, we're looking at it from the holistic whole person approach and looking at managing a population, whether that be a Medicaid population, whether it be a Medicare beneficiary population, or a, a, an early stage of life population. We're looking at it from the holistic perspective, the whole continuum of care. Expanded coverage, elimination of redundancy, standardization of care, so we have the ability to actually have um, an opportunity to get outcomes um, on a more consistent basis, reduce volumes. As we keep people healthier and well, hospital admissions and outpatients visits should decline. I'm going to caveat that because I think with the expansion of health care um, and health insurance in particular, we're going to have a pent up demand because there's going to be people that have not had access to care that now will have access to care which will, I believe, have a resulting effect as far as a spike in care. So I think over time we'll start to see reduced volumes, but initially I think we're going to see an increase in volumes. Payment system, fee for value versus fee for service. We'll talk about how we're moving to that model and being prepared for that. This is the challenge really for for a healthcare delivery system is keeping a foot in the old system, being paid to care for patients in the hospital, that fee-for-service um, value proposition, and then one foot in the new model. Preventive care, managing health of a population, keeping people out of the hospital as we wait for the payment to align. Because right now, this, the healthcare delivery system is paid on that fee-for-service, so that per procedure, that per episode in the, in the hospital, that's how the system is paid, whereas in the future we're looking at being paid to actually take care of the health and wellness of a, an individual, um, keeping them well. So what is an ACO? Well, an ACO is an accountable care organization and at the, at the root of it, it's a group of providers willing and capable of accepting accountability for the total cost as well as the quality of care for a defined population really is looking at a people-centered approach, so people at the center. I like to talk to my team about the three P's, and I'm not referring to the marketing program, I'm really referring to the new three P's, um, that being the person, the patient, and then the population. Looking at it from that perspective, that's the people that we're looking to serve, and do so in a more holistic manner taking all of the different pieces that are, you find around the people and integrating them in, in a way, both via technology and through enhanced communication and, and governance of our, of our healthcare delivery system to really effectuate and give the information to where we can make the best decisions, whether that be the appropriate care setting, and that could be the hospital, and that could be a, a, a long-term care facility, that could even be the home. And then being able to provide that leadership within the community. We do have payer partners that we look to integrate with, whether that be commercial insurers, employers. Some employers are self-funded in our communities. The state through state Medicaid programs and other programs that assist those that are of a, a different um, income status, as well as CMS. And CMS has kind of a dual of duality here in the sense that they also provide funding for the state Medicaid programs but also the Medicare programs whether that be Medicare Advantage, the commercial version of Medicare or the fee-for-service Medicare system. We have core components to the ACO model. Um, we've actually formulated work groups and I'll speak to these later in the slides but these core components are around the leadership of the ACO um, being people-centered as far as developing that foundation. Our health home, which in, is another way of saying a patient-centered medical home. High-value networks, um, population health data management, so getting at the informatics behind the health care being delivered. And then payer partnerships, that being some of the payers that I mentioned, and legal support. There are some things that we have to look at from a legal perspective as we 
develop this new structure. Um, there's a lot of concern around creating a, a market presence that could be dominant, that could have influence on price. It's interesting, we just, David and I met with the Department of Justice in regards to our Pioneer ACO application that we submitted to the um, CMS. And some of the questions that they asked us were specifically around our legal structure and our market presence, and specifically around certain specialties. I found it, I found it enjoyable to go through that line of questioning um, and it, it was also had some irony as well because from the perspective of being able to have a market presence when the federal government's setting the rates, um, it's very difficult for us to have any influence on the rates. So it, it, was, it was a good exercise and I think because our model was so unique, it took a little longer than everyone expected. So the definition of an accountable care organization, patient-centered approach. That is a new way of delivering care to improve the quality and to reduce the total cost for a defined population. Um, new payment system that incentivizes focus on primary care wellness and population health. Engages providers that are clinically and fiscally responsible for the populations they serve. So there's a, diff there's a different approach here that we're asking in the sense that we're asking people to really focus on that individual. And while we're going to build systems around that to assist that clinician in being able to provide care, um, recognizing that we don't want to move them away from being able to see patients, we want to augment what surrounds them from the perspective of being able to manage the population effectively. But we also want to ensure that there's transparency to the clinical outcomes as well as the financial. We want to ensure that we engage patients to actively take responsibility for their health which is very key. You know, there's a slide I'm going to show you towards the end that kind of, kind of level sets it all. But I share this with my team as others in the community as I get out there and speak with folks. But I'll take a trip out to, um, and I don't mean to offend anybody, but I take a trip out on the weekend and I'll go to Boone Dam, catch some sun, hop in the lake. It's been hot this summer. And when I look around and I see a lot of the folks that are within our community and I see the the lack of individual responsibility. I'll give you a good example. Um, just a couple weeks ago I saw a, a little child, a little girl, probably not more than five years old. She was hitting on a Red Bull and I'm looking at that and I'm thinking, wow, five years old and hitting on a Red Bull. We've got a lot of work to do from the perspective of individual accountability. And her mom gave her the Red Bull. This is, is going to be one of our challenges from the perspective of a healthcare system, being more accountable for individual health and wellness. Hospitals and physicians partnering in a deeper way with patients, populations, and payers. And then, as I talked about quality, I talked about cost, I talked about that satisfaction, it then moves us into the new, the new way of looking at objectives, very simply from three perspectives. What is the triple aim? This was something that um, Dr. Don Berwick from the Institute for Healthcare Improvement proposed in, that would redesign and transform the healthcare del delivery system. And what he looked at is from the perspective of if we focus on these three things to improve the health of the population, to enhance the patient experience of care, including quality, access, and reliability, and then looking at the reduction, at least controlling of the per capita cost of care, then we would be successful in being able to bend that curve. So this is something that we've adopted as part of our, our root um, objective of our development of a community-based ACO, focusing on the triple aim, that being population health, experience of care, and per capita cost. We're involved in a national in initiative. This initiative, as you can see, some of these organizations, you probably have heard of them, um, Geisinger, Sumacare, Alanacare, um, You've heard of Mountain States Health Alliance, Presbyterian, Billings Clinic, Fairview Health System. This is a collaborative of organizations, integrated health systems, and we're working in a national initiative, part of this premier organization, to actually take best practices and move down a similar path in being able to implement the change within our communities following and adopting the, the objectives of the triple aim. It does add some, some flavor to our conversations because not, 
it, how things are done up in Montana versus how they're done in eastern Tennessee are a little different. Um, so we, we do have to always look at the, the nuances, but it does allow us to get to a better outcome. We are looking at this healthcare transformation also as a bridge from fee-for-service um, to uh, more of an accountable care. And we look at this bridge from the current fee-for-service system to an accountable care organization. And as I mentioned, those building blocks around people-centered foundation, the health home, these are the ACO components all the way through. And then having that foundational philosophy with the triple aim and then the measurement. So it kind of gives you another picture as to how we're looking to make this as part of a journey and not just a destination. So I've given you a little background on, on accountable care organizations, health care reform, a little bit of insight as to what we're seeing, our approach from a community perspective. Before I get into how we're approaching it, do I have any questions out there in the audience from any of you? All right. Well, we'll dive in and we'll show you the fun stuff. Our vision is really to transform this organization, Integrated Solutions Health Network, into the premier regional community-based accountable care organization. And when I say community-based, it's community-based in every sense of the word. We've partnered with the university, the university physicians, the state of Franklin Healthcare Associates, Mountain States Medical Group, Mountain States Health Alliance, the hospital system, as well as some of the um, community-based physicians to actually form and start to really focus on the mission of integrated solutions, which is really to unlock the value of integration, taking those silos, breaking them down, creating new, a new building, a new structure. Why? To really deliver on um, exceptional health care, better individual health and wellness, and as I mentioned earlier, to create economic vitality within the communities we serve. Because if we can do this better, then that allows us to have more funds available to invest in our community in ways that create jobs. Um, and create jobs that really create uh, an economic value to the people within our community. And it also will, in essence, attract others to come into this community because they will see the value. So the difference give you a little background on Integrated Solutions because we have been around for a little while. Um, integrated Solutions was actually formed as an LLC in um, mid-2009. Prior to that, it was part of a PHO, a physician hospital organization. And that physician hospital organization, it was actually sunsetted as we moved into this new model. Um, it was a rather fortuitous in the sense that ACOs were not part of the vocabulary at that time, but there was a recognition that there was a need to do something different. So this is what we are actually comprised of here within our communities. Um, we're in northeast Tennessee, southwest Virginia, and western North Carolina, and a little bit of Kentucky. A pretty significant physician presence as well as hospital presence. Um, a nice split between primary care and specialty care. And then you'll see some of the ancillary services, whether that be durable medical equipment, home health providers, hospice providers, lab, rehab, and ASCs. The key stakeholder integration, as I mentioned, we're looking to unlock the value of integration. Really define this, and I'll talk to some of them because it's probably really difficult to see the, the yellow. But we looked at the system parent of Mountain States Health Alliance and its presence with its hospital system, the physician group practices that it owns, which is just under um, 400 physicians, and the ancillary services. I talked about the DME, the lab, um, also um, Wilson Pharmacy, which you see over here under the others. And then we had the medical group, State of Franklin, Holston Medical Group, ETSU, integration of those large medical groups. Looking at other facilities and hospitals, Frontier Health, which is really in the realm of behavioral health, Unicoi Memorial Hospital, Laughlin Memorial Hospital, um, as well as um, the FQHCs. We have several of those federally qualified health clinics scattered throughout our service area. We wanted to integrate them as well because they're another component to the healthcare delivery system for the populations that we're looking to serve. 
What was unique in our approach also is that we incorporated several of the large employers in our community because we recognized that one of our, one of our objectives was to create economic vitality. So we looked at some of the larger employers, Mountain States being one of them. We looked at Eastman Chemical. We in, engaged in conversations with Food City, um, KVAT, um, which are our grocery chains, to really bring those employers to the table as well because they have an opportunity to improve the performance from the perspective of health and wellness within their employed population. So we wanted to have them integrated into this process, as well as others. Um, Community-based organizations, we call it CBOs, David's actually working with several agencies on aging in being able to create this care transitions program to assist Medicare beneficiaries as they transition from a hospital inpatient setting into their home and or other facilities such as a skilled nursing facility. You can imagine the amount of work when people have worked in silos for years if not decades <laughs> and then trying to bring them together to get to a common platform that in some ways may step on their toes because we're going to redirect that energy in a different way. We're going to redefine some of these work processes to where we can get the, the whole to work more effectively. That isn't easy. We, th we thought it would, it would be easy at times, but it takes a lot of conversation, talks a lot of working through some of the, the fear that I'm going to become less significant. And what we're trying to do is say, well, you're not going to become less significant. You're going to be more significant. We're going to have better outcomes. And those outcomes are going to be both clinically and financially um, measurable, as well as the satisfaction level from the individual. Because <coughs> I don't know about you all, but I know if I had the opportunity to have my mom at her home having care versus being in a skilled nursing facility or an inpatient setting, that would be the more preferable um, mode of operation. And that's something that David's working on with the agencies on aging as an example. We have other network participants. These are community-based physicians as well as some of the ancillary services. When we look at a Medicare population, one of the things that we recognize that we had a gap within our ability to service the needs of these individuals was dialysis centers because within that population, that's, that's a key component to being able to provide the quality of care that someone that would have some type of chronic illness that would require that as a service. So we had to network those, indivi those individual facilities into our Integrated Solutions Health Network. And then post-acute non-owned facilities. What we're looking to do is integrate and optimize the health system and what I'll do is, I won't spend a lot of time discussing this slide, but we're looking at effective medical management. That's on the delivery side. The network side, being able to competitively price the delivery system. Having some robust risk sharing arrangements in place. So as we do improve quality, as we do improve the efficiency of our system, those savings that we have, we can then share in those savings and redistribute those to those individuals that are providing the care. That's a different model. We're moving again away from the fee for service now into the fee for value. And with, with this, there is a risk component. And then being able to take what we develop and develop a broad product portfolio. So we can approach states, as far as state Medicaid agencies. We can approach individual self-insured employers, as well as participate in other programs, whether that be Medicare Advantage or whether it be the insurance exchanges that as part of health care reform come online in 2014. This is a little complicated, but it gives you the idea as to where we're at. At the bottom of the pyramid, we're at that tier one. We're at the low risk. It's a fee-for-service payment. And then we're moving, and we're going to move gradually as we transition. We're going to move into a moderate risk. We call that tier two. That's a fee-for-service with a partial capitation. Um, and some bundled payments. And a partial capitation, when we use the word capitation, it's a, it's a payment for a specific service, but it's more geared towards looking at the service end to end. And we're looking at partial capitation in the sense that, let's say it's after hours, on call. We're looking at having a, a standard payment, and let's say that's $2 per member per month. 
that would be referred to as a partial capitated payment. So we're looking to incentivize individuals to broaden their practice, broaden their scope. With some bundled payments. We are looking at the bundled payments, which is another form of um, a capitated arrangement in the sense that we've defined a specific service and we've associated a cost to that service. We've associated quality metrics to that. So we're looking at some bundled payments. And then moving to tier three, which is high risk. This is full or partial capitation extensive bundled payments. So we're really moving. I showed you that bridge. We're moving from the fee for service all the way to that fee for value. This is where there's significant skin in the game for the individuals that are providing care. And there's going to be significant skin in the game from the perspective of that individual. Because as I mentioned, the products that we talked about, we're looking at designing within that product structure incentives, both financial and other, for the individual to be more participatory in their care. So for example, um, as they have their initial plan year, completing a health risk assessment that would then be able to be used by their um, primary care physician to be able to identify the appropriate care um, or the um, clinical pathway to treat that individual to ensure their health and wellness. We do have a continuum over to the side, moving from fee-for-service all the way to the global payment. But then we also have where we're transitioning from an affiliated network that was Integrated Solutions about a year ago to really implementing care management practices for a population. On July 1st of this year, we actually transitioned the Mountain States Health Alliance team members and their dependents, just under 15,000 individuals, onto our new platform. And we've introduced new care management models and we're redesigning um, our care plans within our delivery system. We're then migrating into patient-centered medical homes, starting with some of our practices, um, and then looking to develop a model that then spreads out within our community. We've actually partnered with Geisinger Health System to assist us with designing that model, specifically to fit within the integrated solutions um, health network. And then ultimately, achieving that status of accountable care to where we are taking full financial as well as clinical risk for the health of a population. It's not a race, it's a journey. I hear it a lot, people saying, well, geez, I don't think we're moving fast enough. And I said, well, guys, we've only been at this at a year. And look at where we've come, and I'll show you a little bit about this. But before I do, this is another view. Primary care accounts for only 5% of care costs, but impacts 100%. And by that, we mean we have that consumer, that person who then becomes the patient within primary care, specialty care, outpatient, ancillary care, inpatient, and pharmacy care. What we're really looking at is the primary care to drive, drive the enrollment, have the network the adequacy, the quarterback for care coordination, key to manage care programs, and key outcome-based contracts. What we're really looking to do is have this primary care focus be at the foundation of our ACO and that really being around the patient-centered medical home, recognizing that we're talking about populations now and we're talking about a more holistic view of being able to care for that individual. The um, patient-centered medical home concept, it was, it's not something new. It was developed in the 60s. Um, comprehensive primary care services that facilitate communication and shared decision-making between the patient, his or her primary care providers, and other providers in the patient's family. So again, unlocking the value of integration, taking down those silos. And unfortunately, you know, when you think of what created those silos, because this is really going back several decades, the payment system. You know, it, it really did incentivize to have these siloed approaches. Um, and what we're doing is looking to break down those silos and become more integrated. Dedicated care coordination team of allied health professionals charged with active care plan follow-up to minimize care gaps and promote care plan compliance for healthy lifestyles. Again, this is where we look to augment the primary care practice. And by augment, I mean that may be placing care managers within each of the primary care practices to assist in that coordination of care. 
and there will be opportunities for introduction of new technologies, 24-7 um, nurse line capability, et cetera, to help that continuum to improve so we can eliminate the gaps. Reimbursement model retains fee-for-service methodology with the addition of meaningful significant gain share incentives. We talked about some of the partial capitation. We talked about some of the bundle payments. This is something that, again, it's tier two. So we're looking at that tier two. And we're looking at providers grouped into compatible panels. I'm going to talk about this a little bit as we go into the slides because I think this is what makes our model unique and makes it very effective within the community. But we are looking to organize our network into what we call pods. Those are physician organized delivery system. And we'll discuss that a little bit here in a, a short minute. We are also embarking on developing EHR capabilities. Um, that's within the medical practices such as ETSU or State of Franklin, but also Mountain States Medical Group and some of our community-based physicians. We have to do this so we can get access to the clinical data. We'll have access to the claims data um, so we can do some risk stratification. We can do some data analysis and integration. So we can have some reporting capabilities that are robust enough so when we look at these care teams, they can see the individual and see what's happening. So they can design and communicate the best approach to being able to improve that individual's health and wellness. As I mentioned when we started off, the patient center medical home, it's at the foundation of the ACO. So what we, what we did, you know, to step back a little bit, because th this took a little while to get to this point, because not everybody was ready for it right out the gate. But we had to look at this 10-year visioning process, where we, where, we, where we saw we needed to be within the next 10 years, and how are we going to gain greater transparency to both clinical as well as the financial component of what was happening with the financing of health care with the populations. We recognized we had some gaps. We had the network. We were having conversations. We were developing some of the, the, the infrastructure that around the, the um, electronic health record as well as some of the clinical pathways. But we lacked organization around our ACO in being able to integrate and bring these different um, parties to the table and get them engaged in, in a way that gave them a, a level playing field. And then we also lack the ability to manage the benefit side. We talked about payer partnerships. That's not as easy as it sounds. Um, specifically when some of the payers, the major payers in our marketplace, in our community, are for profit. They're not so open to being transparent whether it be with the clinical data that they're getting from claims or whether it be from the financial data, that being from the premiums that they collect and the claims costs associated with that. So what we recognize that if we were going to be effective in being able to have a complete line of sight with what was happening, both clinical as well as the administration of the benefits, we had to create a, a, a health plan, and that's Crest Point Health. So Crest Point Health is the health plan, and that's the plan that we moved the team members from a, from a national um, insurer to Crest Point Health for Mountain States on July 1st. We're opening that up for other members in the community, and as I mentioned, we have plans to do other things as well. But that gives us that line of sight, it gives us the line of sight to the claims data. We also had a speed to value proposition here as well, because to build a health plan typically costs 10 20 million dollars to do so. We didn't have 10 or 20 million dollars to put into this effort and we didn't have the time. So what we did, if you remember that slide I showed you where we had the ACO implementation collaborative, Rob started to meet with different people across the country, different systems that already had an integrated health plan. Presbyterian out in New Mexico, uh, Martin's Point up in Portland, Maine, uh, looked at Johns Hopkins out in the uh, Baltimore area, and we met with the folks from Geisinger and settled on a partner out in, up in Akron, Ohio, Summa Health System, which had a health plan called Summa Care. They've been in the business for 20 years, um, multiple um, business lines. We actually talked to them and entered into a strategic partnership to be the back office for our organization, to actually process the claims, manage the data. 
Um, we've developed a team of individuals here with the expertise around population health management to facilitate that. David being one of them around integrated health management, looking to unlock the, the value of integration. But then we've also introduced a clinical care management program as well, so we could look at managing the population more effectively. This gives us the total continuum. We'll still look to partner with CMS, the state, other commercial payers, but we knew we need to innovate and innovate now to better prepare the community for the future and to start to change the paradigm, the healthcare paradigm. Um, a new care collaborative. Um, it's an organization, as I mentioned, of healthcare practitioners and partners that have come together to provide the community with exceptional health care, greater value for every dollar spent on health and wellness services, and better results as measured by member and patient satisfaction. So what we did, not just putting the words behind it, we formed a separate LLC in a new care collaborative because we recognized that this couldn't be hospital driven. It couldn't be integrated solutions driven. It had to be community driven. And we did this in a way to where we could actually start to break it down and break it down by this perspective of being able to formulate and build an, the a new care collaborative at the community level. There's a lot of collaboration around um, the, the development of this organization. There is a lot of physician leadership and it's being driven and led by physicians. I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. It takes much time to establish guidelines of care, measurements, enforce parameters to demonstrate the value. We're building a strong IT infrastructure for both the hospitals and the physicians. Developing uniform metrics around the evaluation of the quality of care. Establishing an incentive system um, that would drive us toward those desired results. And also redesigning some of the clinical care delivery systems, whether that be around chronic illnesses such as diabetes or hypertension, to inpatient types of services. Um, we, have, uh, we have one service line around cardiology that we're looking at to really define it and to create a standard of care that we could then roll out throughout the community as, a, as an example. And what we wanted to do is not underestimate the effort. While we've been at this really hard and heavy over the last year, we recognize that there's a timeline to this. And I'm going to talk about that because Having spent some time out in Malibu and going to Pepperdine, I did learn how to surf. And I recognized that I didn't want to create options, but I wanted to go in a wave concept to where we could ride that wave into the next wave. And we'll talk a little bit about that because one of the things that we saw in being able to take stakeholders and start to integrate them, you're starting to change not just the expectation around behavior, but also who's going to be responsible for what. And as I mentioned with David's example, that can be rather challenging and it can be rather threatening. So we didn't want to underestimate that. So we created a wave strategy to help us down that path. The value of participating in this collaborative, a new care, really access to patients covered by commercial and government health plans. Again, through Crest Point or through our payer partnerships, we're going to offer the opportunity for um, those entities to contract and partner with a new care. So it will give folks access to um, individuals, people. Um, we're also offering a participation in shared savings and other payer incentives. So as we improve the quality of care, the efficiency of care, they have the opportunity to share in those savings. Today, I can give you an example. Mountain States implements changes to their ER practices and they implemented an ER redirection program. So they're doing some initial screening in their facilities to ensure that the individual is getting care in the most appropriate setting based on cost, quality, and satisfaction. Well, that means a lower utilization of ER services as people are re redirected to their primary care physician or redirected to an urgent care setting. And what has traditionally happened is that the payer, and let's say that's a major national player or a major state play, payer, I'm not going to name names, but you know who I'm referring to, they have kept those savings 100%. 
And that means that those savings went to Minneapolis or they went to Hartford or they went to Chattanooga, et cetera. I think you get the picture. Well, what we're talking about through this collaborative is those savings staying here in the community and they get redistributed. So there's that incentive as to why do I want to change if it's going to impact my bottom line? Well, it may impact your bottom line, but that change got better outcomes, and as a result, we're able to have these savings, which then get redistributed. So that's a key component as far as why participate. Participation in decision making. We're creating this from the perspective of there's going to be a board of directors, there's going to be committees, um, and there's going to be the pod leadership at the local level. And we'll get into that in two seconds. But that decision making, we're not talking about the decision making being made from an organization in Chattanooga or Minneapolis or Hartford, we're talking about right here in our own community. So in a lot of ways, we're, we're directing and the individuals that are participating are directing that conversation. And we're, integrated solutions will provide a lot of the data, a lot of the infrastructure, but the, the decision making stays where it should in the community. Healthcare is local. And then the potential for future regional linkage, whether that be Knoxville, Asheville. I talked about strategic agility, and I have to tell you, we're on the forefront of it. Um, you can Google us, Mountain State, Integrated Solutions, Rob Slattery, Dennis Vonderbeck. Um, what we're doing is, because we are out there, out front, we are a little visionary in this. Others within our region are starting to ask us, well, we don't want to be left behind, but at the same time, we recognize that you are much further along in this than we are. And your model looks like it's something that it has that agility to be able to be something that we can adopt for our, our region. So we are doing it in such a way that we can potentially link from a regional system of care and then grow it. So I, I like to say, we, we hear all about you know clouds today and typically around computing clouds. Well, I'd like to see that we create a cloud of ACOs that we can just link together and provide a higher quality product for the communities that we serve. So that may be something you see in a, in a book somewhere down the line. Um, the the Anu Care Collaborative, we did kind of align to a certain um, you know image with the Anu Care Collaborative and being able to, to have a a horizon with a, a sun and stars, but what we've done is those work groups that we've talked about and being able to formulate the, the work groups, this is really the architect component of it. So over the past year, we've, we've had seven, we've gone down to three now, but this is really to ensure that from an architectural perspective, we're designing it in a way that is, um, is done to create that agility, the effectiveness and alignment to the uh, triple aim objectives. So again, these are things that I talked about in the earlier slides, and it's, um, it's still at the foundation. We'll probably transition as we start to move into the actual operational component of the ACO. But to give you an idea as to how we looked at this from a foundational perspective, this is the Mountain States hospital system, um, you know, coming down from Madison County all the way up to um, South Southwest Virginia up in the Taswell Buchanan. But what we looked at, and when I first saw this, I saw the opportunity to take this hub and spoke model and start to design the ACO around it. While these circles represent something different to mountain states, when we looked at them, we saw these circles as service areas to service a population, the hub being the hospital, and then that spoke being the service area. And we started to define metrics around um, ratios around primary care, specialty care, and multiple specialties, um, and being able to identify where we had network gaps within those communities to where we'd have to fill them, whether they be primary care or a specific specialty. And we started to define these as pods. And what we meant by that, again, the physician organized delivery system, so we could then start to link these together under the A New Care banner. And doing so allows us to keep it local, but at the same time have a governance structure that we ensure that the, the entire community 
from a healthcare delivery system perspective, continues to transform over a period of time and that we have the ability to share lessons learned and also some of the challenges so we can ensure that we're all moving in the same direction. The pod concept, when we started to really look at it from the perspective of the access to care and we looked at the population, we looked at the network, it didn't get, it didn't stay pretty with those circles. As you can see, it, it got a little different, a little jagged in areas. But we knew we were effective in the sense that we got to a specific um, structure that we could actually implement. So this is what it looks like from an ACO perspective. And this is unique to our community, unique to our approach in the sense that we actually have ISHN here as the board of directors. We have the office of the president, that's my office, with a senior level medical director that has oversight over the ACO from the perspective of having a dual role as a medical director but also a president of the organization and having a board of directors that have a committee structure focused on quality improvement, finance, because again, we're talking about a movement from fee-for-service to a, a risk-based agreement, and then moving to also having compliance within the, the in the infrastructure, because we're talking about contracts now with the federal government, potentially the state government, and being able to care for the health and wellness of the population. And then we have some key process teams focused on clinical excellence, service excellence, stakeholder safety, and occupational uh, or operational excellence. This next one here that I, I, um, I bypassed, the ACO pod, this is the Community Advisory Council. When you saw that map, what we did is we broke that map up into individual pods, which will have local leadership because we recognized that not everything could be managed from Johnson City. We had to engage, we had to integrate the delivery systems within the communities that we serve, and it's a pretty large area, in a way that would be effective, that they owned it, that they managed it, that they directed it. Again, we're providing the information, um, we're providing a structure, we're providing the mechanisms to transfer funds to ensure that we have a compliant program, that we have overall medical um, policy development and around policies and procedures. But we knew that the implementation had to happen at the local level to really effectuate this. Again, this lends itself to being able to go into other communities because we just create another pod, another cloud. Maybe a little difficult to see from the back, but these COGS represent payer requirements around referral pattern tracking, patient education and engagement, benefit alignment here, to provider requirements around EHR implementation, single member health record, patient identification, practice management tools, care plans, evidence-based practice guideline, compliance disease registries, and clinical quality. And then we have the requirements for ISHN with payer support and member engagement around clinical integration and measurement and analytics. So we're providing a lot of the, the back office support to ensure that from a payer requirement and a provider requirement, things are moving all in the same direction. And just to double check my arrows, they're all moving in the right way so the cogs aren't getting clogged up. Crest Point Health. We sat down for hours and hours and hours, um, giving up family time, giving up uh, time at the gym to discuss things with payers. Um, not all the payers were there. I heard things such as, well, our systems won't support it. We can't get at the data. Um, you know, we're, we're not quite there yet. We've got some pilots and we just sat back and, you know, I talked with Dennis Vondervecht and I said, Dennis, you know, we're kind of at that, that tipping point to where we're not finding the payer partnerships now. Um, and it's all coming down to rate reduction, rate reduction. We've got to pay you less, we've got to pay you less because healthcare reform has impacts on payers. There's, mid there's minimum medical loss ratio requirements. There's requirements as far as eliminating pre-existing conditions, expansion to coverage to cover children dependents to age 26, et cetera. So where they were having profit margins here, they're seeing them come down here. Well, they're used to having them up here. So in a lot of our discussions, I kept seeing they wanted to keep them here. 
And that's why they wanted to get the rate reduction from the people that were providing care so they could keep their profits up here. Wasn't in the line with what we wanted to do. Wasn't going to create the level of innovation that we felt we needed to to prepare us for the future. And by the future, I meant the next 10 to 20, 30 years, recognizing that this wasn't just going to happen overnight. So that's what really was the tipping point for us to form our own health plan to where we could start to do these innovative um, things and we could support the ACO in being able to be transparent with both the clinical information that we get from claims data, but also the financial information. Because candidly, for integrated solutions for Crest, Point, or Anu, our goal isn't to satisfy the demands of someone investor on Wall Street. It's to ensure that we're achieving the objectives here within our community. And at the end of the day, we don't have to show that profit. That gets redistributed, whether that be lower premiums for individuals, lower co-pays, lower deductibles, whether it be a redistribution of those savings to physicians, to hospitals, to ancillary providers, that's our job. And really to ensure that we have something sustainable in the future. Because again, what we're trying to do is control the cost of care. Because as you saw from the previous slides, the GDP, the gross domestic product, healthcare costs has taken a greater, greater chunk of that. We want to ensure that we kind of reverse that trend. So Crest Point Health, it's comprised of a network component, an integrated health management component, a sales and marketing component, an operational piece, a health services management, specifically around utilization management, case management, disease management, behavioral health, pharmacy management, clinical programs, and quality management. We have a compliance um, arm focused on grievances and appeals, being a liaison with CMS, vendor management, fraud, waste and abuse, and legal services and an internal audit. Crest Point Health, really the business of integrated health management, and I'll just really focus on these pieces here, developing products and services, managing customers and products, develop and manage a provider network, manage and provide care through that network and administer the accounts, whether that be individuals, whether it be self-funded groups or uh, accounts that we have with um, CMS and or the state, and manage the loyalty and the renewals. We have the enabling processes, which are more aligned with the finance and accounting, human resources, the IT, the project management, et cetera. And the strategic processes up at the top, brand, communication, value innovation, and resource management. Really, at the, the forefront of this, we get back to this slide a little more detail this time. Um, we're looking to move from a fee-for-service network into an exclusive provider network and then moving to a risk-bearing entity. So we can participate in programs such as the ACO, the medical program, having payer alliances, a fully integrated third-party administrator, that's the benefits administration capabilities we have today, participating in the Medicaid and Medicare Advantage programs as well as commercial insurance. The exchanges are key. Um, and I'll, I'll just touch on that a little bit. In 2014, um, through the Accountable Care Act, there is, a, um, there is a development around exchanges, and that's where individuals will go to get insurance. So Crest Point Health, that's the website. The key milestones, I talked about WAVE strategy. It takes us well out beyond 12, 2012, um, and it gets us into different um, different products, different services. We look at it as a community approach and unlocking that value of integration. Providers being key from a quality efficiency and the patient experience and population-based measures. And this is a slide I wanted to show you to kind of wrap things up. It kind of gives you the, um, the view as to where we're kind of at today, but over the course of time, this is the this is the Centers for Disease Control, CDC. These are the maps specifically around obesity. Um, we have to be able to change individual behavior to really effectuate change in our healthcare system. And it's going to take some time. And as you can see, over the past couple uh, decades, it's, it's changed dramatically. 
And um, this is where we just leave you with this, these thoughts, um, and I'll open it up for questions from the, from the folks out in the audience. I think, I think what we're going to see is really a, a change from the perspective of a skill set that can work with a population and work with a population from the perspective of the earlier stage of life to the later stages of life. That being a, a very well educated from the perspective of having some ability around um, business acumen to having the clinical um, component to be able to manage that population and do so in a way that is an effective communicator, effective collaborator, um, being able to participate not just in the delivery of care but understanding the financial component as well as the, the metrics, the measurement of the results as far as the quality of care. And that kind of goes into the medical economics, the informatics component because there is going to be a high degree of implementation around systems that support the delivery of care and being able to be very astute and knowledgeable as to how those systems work and how they can be improved is going to be very important. Okay, thank you, uh, Robert, very, very Thank much. you. This was very helpful, very informative.